My friend Stanley brought me a new shirt. Stan is here. Right. Was he a so tailor of some kind? years at the NHL. That's what it's Who all about. Who is Stan that uh, he brought you a shirt? It'll be Stanley Cup. He's right now outside getting polished up and getting ready to come in here. And I get to spend the rest of the day with Stanley. It's all in conjunction with the NHL animated series. Got it. Which is where like a guy like Wayne Gretzky will talk about winning the cup. He'll tell the story. Right. And then they'll put it like in cartoon form. Oh, cool. And then I'll do the ins and outs to each of the great players oh, I that are reminiscing. You. So I said, okay, I'll do it, but I, got, but I got to have the cup for a while. Oh, that's that seems like a fair trip. It's as another. close as you're ever going to get to the I, cup. Oh, uh, shut up. I mean, what you have, I'm just going to bring the thing in so we can just move past this. Cup is here, and Boomer's going to introduce the animated pieces. That's right. And going to spend the day with the cup. Well, so the NHL has given me the Stanley Cup for a day, and how lucky am I? What am I going to do with it? I'm going to take it all over New York City. I'm going to take it down to the first precinct of the NYPD. I've asked all of my hockey buddies from my WAS hockey team to have lunch with Lord Stanley's Cup. And in the middle of all of that, we're going to be talking about NHL animated stories. And who better to start this program off than the great Wayne Gretzky? Not only was he the great one on the ice, he's also a great storyteller off the ice. This is the story of when we hid the Stanley Cup from the Philadelphia Flyers. In 87, we were up three games to one against the Flyers, playing game five in Edmonton. Mike Keenan brought the Stanley Cup into the Flyer locker room before game five, told everybody not to touch it. They won game five, went back to Philadelphia. The same thing was gonna happen for game six. They brought it in the locker room, and of course they won game six. So we went back to Edmonton for game seven. There was a Barnum and Bailey circus that was in the Edmonton Coliseum. So we didn't play uh, game seven until three days later from Wednesday till a Saturday. And every team would supply a, a third attendant in the locker room to help with extra equipment and sticks and ice and sodas. And I think he mentioned it to Glenn after game five that they had the cup in their room. So Glenn got the Stanley Cup in the crate that it's in and he hid the Stanley Cup. <laughs> well, everybody before the game was looking and searching for the Stanley Cup because the Flyers wanted to keep it as their good luck charm. Obviously, professional athletes are very superstitious. Every guy is to a fault, actually. And he was trying to find some way to break their momentum. And he proceeded to tell the National Hockey League that it must have got mixed up with the uh, Barnum and Bailey boxes and it was on its way to Calgary. And so the National Hockey League was obviously scrambling around looking for the Stanley Cup because it was game seven and we needed a trophy to present. Well, as the game started five minutes into the game, uh, lo and behold, Glenn uh, had one of the trainers present the NHL security with the Stanley Cup. And uh, the Oilers won and the rest is history. <laughs> I'm Wayne Gretzky and that was my tale. Guys, get ready. We were hoping the New York Rangers would bring this yeah, cup here. Yeah. But we'll take it. Now you guys can take the pictures with it. You can do all the selfies awesome. you want with it. It's my day with the cup, and what do I do? I bring it to the first precinct with the greatest police department in the world, the NYPD captain and chief. Thank you so much for allowing me to bring the cup here to you guys, because I know you guys, of all people, appreciate the sacrifice that it takes to win this beautiful cup. Now, you talk about policemen. Who was one of the greatest policemen of all time? His name is Marty McSorley. Played for the Edmonton Oilers, and what a story Marty has. And where do you hear who had his back when he needed it most? This is my Stanley Cup story. You always dream about winning the Stanley Cup. You see the parade. We in Edmonton, when we were lucky enough to win it in Edmonton, we're then going to have the parade. And we were out a little late the night before with Lord Stanley. And the cup is sitting there, and everybody's having a great time. And you're going over, you're touching it, you're having fun with everybody. And you assume that it's just kind of looked after. 
Well, I got to the bus. There was a big bus where all of us would wait for the parade to start. And so I walked down the bus, and Glenn Saylor looked at me and said, where's the Stanley Cup? And I said, I don't know. Glenn Anderson has it. So I'm sitting there, and there's, most of the guys are there on the bus. And they're looking at me, and I said, I don't have it. And so then Glenn Anderson come on the bus, and they said, Glenn, where's the cup? And he said, Marty has it. They said, Marty's already here. The only guy missing is Mark Messier. And I'm sitting there going, oh, gosh, Mess, I really hope you have the cup. I hope you picked it up where we were and took it home with you. Well, they called Mess, finally got a hold of him, and he had the cup. So the police went to Mess's building where he lived, and Mess got in it with the cup, drove the wrong way down the parade route, sticking his head out of the window with the cup, and everybody's looking for the parade to come from one direction. Here's Mess coming the other way in a police car. Mark Messier, one of our leaders in Edmonton, such a great playoff performer once again, rose to the occasion. And I'm thinking, you know, as great as this is to win the Stanley Cup and be involved in the parade, thank God Mess had the cup. I'm Marty McSorley, and I approve this story. Coming up on NHL Animated, more of his story and what a story it is in Afghanistan, and a story from a guy named Lucky. And boy, was he pretty lucky. You know, New York City's finest is all about sacrifice and commitment, and that's what you need to have if you want to win this cup. This next fella, well, he certainly embodied all of that and more. Take a look at this, the 1993 Canadians. If it's not broken, why fix it? This is a story about the 93 Stanley Cup Finals. One of the things that people know how I played, I was really trying to avoid blocking shots in the semifinals. I've blocked a shot, one rare shot I blocked in my career. I really tried to get it out of the way, but it hit me on the side of my foot. Gave me a line fractured on the right side. Going into the finals, I played game one. After game one, my foot swelled up and wasn't able to play game two. Once we won game three and game four, and leading the series three games to one, things had really settled down on my foot. The swelling was all gone, so I was able to put my skate on. I said, personally, I know we're going to win tonight. I don't need to be in uniform to win the cup. I think you should be changing the lineup. At the time, to have your name on the cup, you needed to play one game in the finals. So Jacques went on to dress Donald Dufresne, who hasn't played in the finals yet. He was the only player that didn't play in the finals. We went on and, and won that game 5-1. to one, and Donald, his name's on the cup forever. So, you know, it was the right decision to make. and. Of course, I was not in uniform when we won the cup. I'm on the ice with my suit on, next to Patrick Waugh. So these are moments that you can never forget. I mean, that's pretty special. And Evan Donald, when I see the cup, I see his name on there. It's, it means more. They say you got to pay a price to win the cup, which is very true. No, he owes me a lot. <laughs> Well, we just left the first precinct, the NYPD, great men and women that protect our city here. And uh, we went back and changed. And this is my son, Gunner. You can see he's wearing his coat and tie, and his tie is a Wasp hockey tie. That's my men's league hockey league team. Gunner is on the team. I'm the owner. I'm the general manager and the coach. And that's just the way it's going to be. So, Gunn, as you can see, we have the Stanley Cup here. We're going to lunch with our teammates. And how many men's league hockey teams are actually going to have lunch with the Stanley Cup? It's sitting here, it's belted in. Do you know why I belted it in today? There's a story tied to this. Why wouldn't you see belt the Stanley Cup in? Well, there's a guy by the name of Lucky. His name was Luke Robitaille. You probably met him when he was playing for the Kings, but he won this cup in 2002 with the Red Wings. And Ken Holland, their general manager, said, hey, you want to take the cup for a day? And he said, sure, I'd love to. Here's his story. Where do you see this one? This is the time Lord Stanley rode shotgun with me. The day after we won the Stanley Cup, Ken Holland, our GM, asked me, he says, hey, Luke, uh, do you want the cup tomorrow? And I was like, really? Like, you're giving it to me? He goes, yeah, take it home and uh, just bring it back to the team party tomorrow. So I called my wife, come and pick me up. I got a surprise for you. So she comes with the both kids. And because my wife was still living in LA that season, she rented like a little car. And so she picks me up with the two boys. 
So I give her like the address where we're going and we go to this house. I come out with the Stanley Cup, so I told her, you gotta sit in the back with the boys and we ended up putting the cup on the front seat. We're driving around Detroit and I'll never forget stopping at a red light and people would look, they could see like a Stanley Cup on the passenger seat of this small car. You expect to see the cup in some type of limousine or some armored truck and it was just sitting in our rental car there with a seat belt next to us and everybody kept looking and next thing you know everybody was trying to catch up to us every red light. People were taking pictures and trying to stop us and it was just so much fun to see the expression of everyone. We got it home and we did the thing with our boys. They want to watch a movie with the cup. So we put popcorn in the cup and then they, they were like, is your name going to be on it, dad? It's hard to describe, but it becomes like a, this special moment with this trophy, that the greatest trophy in sport. It's something you never forget as a family. I'm Luke Robitaille, and I approve this story. Coming up on NHL Animated, more Stanley Cup stories. That is the Stanley Cup, boys. How are you? Yeah, so my day with the Cup continues as I'm out ready to have lunch with my personal hockey team at Legend Sports Bar here in New York City. Can't wait to get it on. Let's go, boys. Come on. All righty. You want? Yes, you may. Sure, yes. That great. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Come on, God. Help me carry this, will you? I'll get the door. All right, <laughs> this is a great party here in New York City with the Cup, Lord Stanley Cup, but it pales in comparison to the 94 New York Rangers. Who was at those Stanley Cup games? A whole bunch of us. Me and Gunnar were there. We didn't miss one of the games that year, and I tell you, I caught a lot of holy heck out of that. But our goalie, Mike Richter, not only was superb that series, but he has a great story here on NHL Animated. By the time we won in 94, our last two series went uh, seven games. So if you can imagine across a couple months, you're living like a monk. Early to bed, get up, have breakfast, meetings, you practice, watch game film, repeat. And you do this again and again and again mm -hmm. to absolute mayhem after you win. And then you don't sleep for a straight week. You know, it's New York. We hadn't won in 54 years, so this town exploded. I mean, it was, it was absolutely crazy. Visiting family and friends and parties on Long Island, Brighton Beach with the Russian guys. It was incredible. And the beautiful thing about that cup is you do get to celebrate it with people. You just have the Stanley Cup, and it's 30 or 40 pounds, and it's a sunny day in New York, and I kind of didn't think about it. I just I had the Stanley Cup in my arms, and I hailed a cab, and uh, a guy walks by and just goes, is that really the Stanley Cup? Can I touch it? Just put his hand on it like it was a new baby or something like that, you know? It was so much respect. A good friend of ours, she said, you know, I've got a friend who's having a few girls over, and you guys should all stop and just say hi. And of course, it was a bachelorette party, and we went from a really peaceful, quiet meal to a conga line at about 4 in the morning with a cup. That cup would come into a bar or a restaurant, and it was just instant insanity. It would turn the place from fun to, you know, the last party on earth. But after a week or 10 days, there was a couple nights where guys were like, get that thing away from me because I just need to mellow out a little bit. I'm Mike Richter, and that is my tale. I don't know about you, but that was my favorite story, and I will love Mike Richter forever for doing what he did in that series to bring us the Stanley Cup. Now, you see these four guys behind me? They're on my team, but they're Islander fans. Yeah. 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 I don't know why, but I got to make them happy because I need them to feed me the puck so I look good on the ice. So you guys are going to love this. One story is about an 18-year-old Brian Trottier who had a little trouble growing facial hair during the playoffs, and the other is about Dougie Waite, your new head coach of your beloved New York Islanders. So enjoy. Awesome. Yes, finally. <laughs> this is the story of how Playoff Beards got started. So I'm an 18-year-old kid, 
We just finished the playoffs in junior hockey back in Lethbridge. And the Islanders are now down 3-0 to the Pittsburgh Penguins in their second round of their playoffs. And it's the first year they've ever been in the playoffs. I was really excited when the phone rang and Bill Torrey says, do you want to come up? We're playing uh, game four in Long Island. I said, yes, I'm in. And it was awesome because when I walked in, the guys all said, we're not shaving. And they win mm -hmm. game four. They <laughs> come to Pittsburgh, win game five. We go back to Long Island and they win game six. And we come back to Pittsburgh to win game seven. And next round, they did the same thing against Philadelphia. The guys just kept the beards going. And they darn near came back, got to a 3 nothing deficit and forced to game seven. Some of these guys, J.P. Parisi, Drew Duran, Billy Harris, Ed Westfall, they got full beard in like a week. Me, I'm 18 years old. I got like eight whiskers on, on my whole chin. And it was really fun to be a part of that and see that this little lore of not shaving actually worked and gave them a little bit of success. And that's why guys today are growing those beards because they believe that's going to be the luck that drives them through those Stanley Cup playoffs. I'm Brian Trache, and that's my tale. This is my Stanley Cup story about a bad shoulder injury and a worse beard. 2006 Finals Game 5, I took a pretty good hit. Got a little malachi crunch, a grade 4 separation on my shoulder, and painfully watched Game 6 as we got spanked in Edmonton and came home in Game 7 and tried to take warm up and it wasn't going to happen, so I kind of slowly got dressed as the game started. And it was painful because I couldn't move my arm, so I'm trying to tape my skates and have everything done. I poured water on my head. I marked up my stick so it looked like I played and was standing there in full uniform, and we scored in the empty net. I'll never forget it. I started crying a little bit, and I look over, and I saw Glenn Wesley, and he's like, get up here. So there was about 50 seconds left, and I was on the bench, which is a penalty. That would have been a bad way to lose the cup. We were just hugging and jumping around, and I remember going out on the ice and, and trying to lift the cup, and I heard... <laughs> <laughs> and I felt like I was like this, and then I saw the pictures after, and I was about like this far. We went off the ice, and I come in the room, and can't even move. Everybody kind of partied in there for an hour, and you have these huge, obnoxious playoff beards. Mine was pretty full and thick, and I got a little bit of an upper lip problem, a little Bruce Willis syndrome here. I got a lot of room. I thought it'd be funny to put the big handlebars, and I got upstairs, and the whole place goes nuts, and everybody's taking pictures, and the families are there. And I just see my wife glaring at me, and she's like, you get, you're not ruining our pictures. And she, get downstairs right in front of all the guys. I'm sent back downstairs to shave my mustache, my handlebars that I thought would be funny. So it's humbling to see that uh, things didn't change much after winning the Stanley Cup. She told me what to do, and I had to go do it. I'm Doug Waite, and that was my tale. Coming up on NHL Animated, more Stanley Cup stories. Welcome back, everyone. And Mike, I have to say thank you for allowing me to spend the day with Lord Stanley's Cup. It was our pleasure. I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. I think my hockey team certainly enjoyed it, and I know everybody in New York enjoyed me having it here. You know, you, you actually have the greatest job in the world. As I tell people, Boomer, I have the second greatest job in the world. I think the greatest job is getting to play for the Stanley Cup and get your name on it. And my favorite part is when a player brings it home and shares it with their family, get to be a fly on the wall. There are a lot of stories they'll talk about on camera, and some will go in the vault for life. What people don't know about you, you're kind of like James Bond. You actually took the Cup to Afghanistan, didn't you? We did, yes. Where do you see Mike's story coming all the way from the desert of Kandahar when he brought the cup with him? Back in 2007, the NHL and the Hockey Hall of Fame were able to organize a trip over to Afghanistan to visit the troops. We flew into Kandahar on a military plane, but we had to do a tactical landing in case we were getting shot up by the Taliban. And so we had to do the plane going swinging out, dropping down, and shooting in. So it was a bit of a hairy landing. That's when I really realized that we were in a war zone with the Stanley Cup. We got on the ground safely, of course, and we got the cup out, and we were taking pictures of some of the top brass and everybody, and the place just went berserk. It was really cool to see all the different soldiers in their uniforms getting pictures of the Stanley Cup. Cool thing about this experience was all the NHL jerseys that came out of the woodwork, and I was amazed that, you know, here we are in the middle of Afghanistan in a war zone, and all the different jerseys. It being so hot over there, uh, I decided I needed a shower. So I went back to the barracks with a cup. As I was getting undressed, all of a sudden the air raid siren went off. And I'm like, that doesn't sound too good. And I decided to sit tight. And I sat on the Stanley Cup case with a towel around me reading a magazine. I can hear the air raid siren. I can hear fighter jets taking off the whole bit. 
This goes on for maybe about 15 minutes. It stops, and I go and grab my shower. As I'm coming out of the showers, um, the rest of the group that I went over to Afghanistan with were rolling back into the barracks, and they were all like, hey, Mike, where were you during the missile attack? Missile attack? What are you talking about? Yeah, we were under attack. There were missiles flying into the base. What were you doing? Well, I sit on the Stanley Cup case reading a magazine. They're like, holy cow, you're dedicated to your job. So Stanley and I were the only two that didn't take cover uh, during the missile attack. I actually said to the guys, I said, I actually thought it might have been a drill. And one of the colonels said, Mike, we don't have drills in Afghanistan. I'm Mike Bolt, and I approve this tale. Wow, that's an amazing story. Is that really true? Well, as far as I know, I mean, like I said in the story, I didn't know what was going on. I mean, right. I was just sitting on the cupcakes reading a magazine. Could you believe the reaction that you received when you finally got there? No, to be honest, we get to work in the world of fun. It's all business over there. And just seeing all the jerseys come out of the woodwork and everything like that was just really incredible to see. And I mean, there's a lot of hockey fans in the military. So in 1995, the Keeper of the Cup became an actual real job. So you could thank the New York Rangers of the 94 season and we do. for that because <laughs> they got a little too handsy with this we thing. Yeah. But you know what? In 1995, both you and I know the guy, Bill Guerin, had a scare of a lifetime when this cup was supposed to be delivered to his house. Check it out. This is a story about getting the Stanley Cup in 1995. Obviously, everybody had great anticipation for the cup coming to their house and getting a day with it. You're all excited, you've got all your plans. And I remember being in contact with Pat Plunkett, who was the, the cup keeper at the time. And it was about an hour and a half, two hour ride, and it felt like forever. And, and we were like little kids waiting for the Stanley Cup to show up. He finally pulls into my parents' driveway. All excited, we help him out with the, with the anvil trunk and he opens it up. And it was empty. And my heart dropped. And he looked at me and he said, oh my God, I think I forgot it at the last stop. And I just, I wanted to choke him. I, I just couldn't believe it. But then he couldn't hold his laughter anymore. And he went in the back seat and uncovered it with the blanket that he had and he got me good. I, I literally wanted to kill him. <laughs> I'm Billy Guerin and I approve this puck to have. Oh, that was awesome. Okay, Boomer, it's time to wrap it up. Your cup day is coming to Already? Next. Already, yeah. Can I get it for another 24 hours? No, I, sorry, you please. Can't. Can I please have it for another 24 you hours? Get the same amount of time as the players. Sydney Crosby has 24 hours, that's it? Yeah. All right, well, at least I had my day with the cup, and what a day it was. And I just want to say thank you so much for bringing it to me. Thank you for letting me have it for the day. And I hope everybody enjoyed NHL Animated as much as I did. These Stanley Cup stories are rich in history and legacy. Tell you what, Boomer, you can have a pair of the white gloves to remember your day by. Well, at least it's something. Oh, see you, baby. Thanks, Boomer. See you, Mike. Please come back. Oh. Is that really the Stanley Cup? Can I touch it? Just put his hand on it like it was a new baby or something like that. It must have got mixed up with the Farm and Bailey boxes and it was on its way to Calgary because it was game seven and we needed a trophy to present. I remember trying to lift the cup and I heard <laughs> and I felt like I was like this. And then I saw the pictures after, and I was about like this far. And that's why guys today are growing those beards, because they believe that's going to be the luck that drives them through those Stanley Cup playoffs.